today the Malden time capsule documentary series continues and today we're covering the Linden projects now there'll be some of you out there that will be like what business does Forbes have to cover the Linden project seeing that he's from the other project area now, there might have been rivalry about which projects were better, which projects were tougher. But I don't remember any, like, scheduled uh, rumbles, if you will. But I will explain my relationship and how I came to be a frequent flyer in the Linden Projects. Now... It was 1985, sophomore in high school, and I was in between transition from field athlete to like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to be because I got no skill, no coolness, until I met a fellow by the name of Vincent Leo Trent. This guy was cool. This guy owned a fucking guitar. It was a Fender, so I thought, but no. The popular thing was, for us kids who couldn't afford anything close to that, Hondo made a Fender prototype that looked like a Fender and certainly looked cool enough because it was electric and not too many people had them. So Vinnie Trent... He was cool, man. He he had a reputation, and he had a fucking band in high school. The first high school band I ever heard of with a cool name, Deathwing. In that band consisted of a lineup of Vincent Trent on lead guitar, Jim Brower on bass, <laughs> John Keats, six foot ten on rhythm guitar, Mike Wheeler was on the drums in fronting the fucking band. You could not have had a cooler aesthetic look than Diamond David Ditto Donahue on lead vocals. This motherfucker looked the part. All the ladies were into him. And, um, God, I couldn't even approach the guy. I was intimidated by his by his handsome looks. Best looking dude in Malden High at this time. Anyhow, I want to know more and more about this death lane, De death wing, where they practiced. Only problem was they didn't practice at all. It was like it was like having a gang that didn't fight. This was just simply a band that didn't play. Vinny and Jimmy played. They, they could play the instruments, but Keats, Wheeler, I never heard play. And David Donahue, who I uh, later learned to get to know, was shy as hell. There was no way he was getting in front of a mic. But anyhow... I wanted in. I wanted into this band that didn't play a practice. I want. It was like being part of an identity. So Mike Wheeler was fired. Vinnie Trent, whom I believe I met in art class. I told him, I was like, dude, I got a drum set. Meanwhile, it was my brother's. I, I had not played a lick of drums yet. And uh, without even auditioning me, he was like, you're in. So there you have it. There's the front story of, of, of Linden. Um, that being said, Vinny wasn't a Linden kid. He was more of a drifter. He lived He lived in that tiny little house at the time that was like buried in between Smiley Buick. And um, But since Keats and uh, Ditto were in the band, they were from Linden. So that was our access to going into Linden. I was very, very, very uh, intimidated to go into Linden 
without any kind of protection or at least having someone I know so that way if someone were to kill me, I'd be like, no, 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 I'm with him, I'm with him. So David Donahue and uh, the Keats brothers, both Scotty and John were my cover. They were my protection. They were able to vouch for me. And that's exactly what they did. However, I used to, since David lived on the edge, like heading out to um, the Salem Street connector, there was an entrance into Linden that way. And that's the way I chose to get in. And I'll tell you why in a minute as I get closer to the area. So these right here were considered the back streets of the Maplewood area now. They had their own crew altogether, but the stragglers that wandered, uh, wandered between Linden and Maplewood would be more on the main drag. Um, like a cat like Kevin Gilligan, who I didn't know, but like right here would be the main mecca of where the transitions would take place. Now for, for high school, all of these kids from Maplewood and Linden to get to the high school would hop on the 108 and then they would get on uh, and, and they would all gather in front of the uh, infamous Steve's Corner. Um, the crowd that would gather, it was, it was like, okay, I knew from the smoking area, Todd Crosby, Kyle... I don't even know if he went to school. I don't remember him there. But those two, the mustaches were just the intimidation factor. These guys, Steve's Corner is still here. You'd have about 190 kids right here buying cigarettes and waiting for the 108. But back to Todd. Now, I met him in the smoking area. Believe it or not, we used to have a fucking smoking area in the high school where you were allowed to smoke. And I can remember uh, Todd, he, the mustache and the mullet. I can remember my first interaction with Todd was, hey, do you have an extra cigarette? And he told me to go fuck myself. He wasn't a friendly guy. Kyle, I didn't know much, but the two of them together, even with Richie, you, you had three mustaches you had to contend with. And I wanted no part of them. And the other figure was Jimbo, Jimbo McDonald, you had your jocks, your, your metal heads, your burnouts, but Jimbo was the only one who presented as a legit skinhead, and he, he, he ran around in the engineer boots, wanted no part of Jimbo, who I later would find out, nicest kid. You just had to get to know him. You, you can't judge a book by the cover. But I would come into the Linden Projects this way just to avoid the mustaches of the Crosbys wanted no part of them. Uh, I was afraid to death of them. So I would come to Ditto's house, which I believe was right there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I would hang here at David Donahue's house. Now, I would always come here more so with uh, Scott Keats, and we would hang up in Dave's room after school every day. No Vinny, just me, Dave, and Scott. And Ricky Kilpatrick. And it was here that I first seen and heard the dream album and we would look at dirty books together the hustler magazines and it was up in that room where the term bullet hole was conceived by scotty keats scotty if you want to tell that story you go right ahead now this area i'm i i, I don't recall very much about it except for the store which i don't believe exists anymore is this where the store was yeah there's no store here I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up Derek with him in a minute but I could have sworn there was a store right here as well anyhow Chapter two of my time in Linden. Now after Deathwing broke up, I had no more business in Linden. That was until 
fourth period English class, Mr. Schwartz. When I met my best friend and my first girlfriend to have lasted more than three months. I'm talking about Renee. We became the power couple of 1985, 86. Only really she carried the star power. I was just along for a ride. I believe Sandra Bemis, my Sunday school schoolmate was in one of these areas, one of these houses in the middle of the projects. Anyhow, with Renee and I as a couple, I now had business back in Linden. Now, let me get out and explain. So I would get dropped off here every day by my dad when Renee and I were dating as uh, two 16 year olds. Renee didn't even have to be home and I would hang out with that family. Trisha treated me like a son. She treated me better than her own daughter. But I would spend days here, days. And um, Joey was just a baby. I used to change his diapers, shitty diapers all the time. And, but the time I spent in this house, every day, 1986. Love this family to this day, every single one of them. Right next to them was actually another wedge. Now I could not, they were not related, right? And uh, yeah, it was just a coincidence. Two wedges, 61 and 59, Bobby lived there. Bobby was about 20 years older than us. I don't remember him ever being friendly. Like, get out of here, kid. So yes, Renee, Joey, Trish, Nicole, loved coming here. And Nicole was always running around with, with Bon Jovi and all the, Renee and Nicole would make me jealous with Cinderella. They'd be like, oh, they'd all get crazy over them. And here I am sitting here like a half a metalhead with greasy, with greasy unpermed hair, 120 pounds. I, I, I don't know what she saw in me because I was not appealing to anybody. But Renee gave me a chance and she made me the cool. She added, she started to add a little bit of cool to what I needed. I would walk around and I would see uh, Joe Johnson. He was the only black kid that had a black biker leather coat and he liked rock and roll and he was the coolest shit. Loved Joe Johnson. Um, now in 1987, there was a fucking coolest event that took place here. There was a concert here. You had Troy Sellers and his band, Vernia Caliper and Erotica doing a double bill on Labor Day week, just before school started, my senior year. Erotica set up here, right here. This was their view, Troy and Vernia. They set up here, they were excellent. Troy, nicest guy, salt of the earth. And uh, what I remember most was Guy, their singer, great singer, but like he was balding. And it was kind of like a taboo thing where you just didn't talk about it, but it was a very image conscience time. And uh, Guy was a hell of a singer. So Erotica set up here and we just had the greatest fucking time here in the Linden Projects. I don't know who sanctioned the show, but one story about this, this show. Now Todd, I keep bringing up Crosby's. More so Todd, he was just, he presented as so unfriendly you had to really work to get him to like you, but it took took me about 20 years to get him to like me. So Erotica's playing, and uh, at this time, he had a broken arm. It was in a sling, and I was here with my best bud, Larry, God rest his soul, and they had a conflict, and Erotica's playing, and they, and they, uh, they start the song, You Think You're Tough by Rat, and then you pan over, and Todd Crosby is throwing down with Larry with one arm 
and Billy announces, hey, you guys over there, you think you're tough. And they go into the song. It was like the perfect seg segue. And Larry and Todd are fighting right there. They let it go for a little while, but this made me even more afraid of Todd that he was willing to fight with one arm. And I think he might've won that one. Again, the mustache. It was the battle of the mustache because back in these days, people didn't grow goatees. They grew mustaches and mustaches only. And if you didn't have a powerful mustache, you had nothing. The Crosby's was just mustache. The mustache mafia. So we're going to move this over now. And I'm going to bring in Derek with him. Okay, so now we added a special guest to this, Mr. Derek Witham. Derek, welcome to the show. Derek, now, you are, without a doubt, in my opinion, the only guy that has allies on every street corner of this city and the only guy that has went to every school in the city. Now, we we grew up together. Same, same neighborhood. Same neighborhood. First thing I know is you're a project kid like me, even though I was on Holloway Street. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're in Brown School now. Masha P. Brown School. Masha P. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute. Now, Derek, how did you end up at Brown School oh. living on Newland Street? It's an interesting story. Okay. So, I grew up in Maplewood originally. Yes, sir. Parents divorced. We end up in Bryan Street, 206, burns down. Cosmo moves into that when they fix it. I end up at 171 Bowden next to Paul Shapley. We become fast friends. So Project Kid from like 76 to 84, I think was when we moved back out. But the most epic time of my life as far as I'm concerned. However, my mother, trying to be a good mom, knew what was going on in that school, that neighborhood in those schools. Now was that, did you go to Daniels? So I went to Daniels in first grade, Mr. Orio's class. Okay. I end up up in Maplewood. I don't know if my mother saw it that early. You know, we're young. So I end up Maplewood, Salemwood. Salem, okay. All right, and then Brown here. And in sixth grade, I'm just a tyrant, and I get expelled. And then they, I end up back at Lincoln School for the last half of sixth grade in Miss Fitzgerald's class. But no time spent at the challenge. No, no, never, never a Y kid. But my mother thought, you know, bad neighborhood, bad kids, keep them out, put them in Brown. I got to get them back in Brown because if he stays in Brown. He won't, you know, be with those kids. You know, I was that kid. Well, here we are at Brown School, Derek. Do you have any good stories? Were you ever rejected? <laughs> rejected? Yeah, like coming in, like, who's how this about, kid? How coming about into... Ronald T. DeSessa, the principal, punched me in the face when I was in sixth grade? He? Like, here, in the in his office. And I had a witness. Wayne Molly was in, in the conference room when he punched me in the face. Now, why was Wayne Molly a brown kid? He should No been. idea, but he was, and he was, he, I think he was a year older than me, but, you know, my, I mean, my mother lawyered up, like, like, after they expelled me, like, we, it went through a legal process behind the scenes. They basically threatened his tenure. That's why they had to let me back in in seventh grade. Well-traveled by sixth grade. <laughs> like, it, it, like uh, I was absent 92 times in sixth grade. It really, actually, it really, it it shows, it shows the origins of your, your, your exquisite uh, social skills. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so Brown School, here it is. Um, yeah, I, I, I was Daniels Lincoln, that's it. And, and then, I don't, I don't like to talk ill about the dead, but that guy was a real piece of shit. Uh, I mean, no he, pun he punched at a 12-year-old kid and it really, it put me in a, in a spot of like you know rejecting authority for like the next two years well daniel school had a guy like that before our time mr ritterhouse was their principal he all my brothers told me he used to hit them all the time smack them in the face yeah i think it was a little different by the time we got there you know what i'm saying but like it, you weren't supposed to be hitting kids you know no i mean i probably deserved it but you know you're still you punch, you punch a 12 year old kid you know i don't know well, here we go, Doug. We're going down Coleman Street. I already covered my time with the Wedge family and my and, and uh, Renee being my first girlfriend. Uh, but that was on this side. Now, where were the Keats located? I think they were next to Pete Kinnon's house, which is the yes. first project house, right? Right, here, right here on the left. If I had to guess a number, I don't. I don't 
Is it I, 60? I, I don't know. 38 yeah. or something? Yeah. I don't know. I think that's it right there. Pete lived on the end unit right there. Pete lived on, he did 42, it. 42, yeah. Yep. And then. And I think the Keats's might have been there, 44. 44. Yeah, I think. Um, but I know that was Pete's for sure. I spent many days in his house. Now, if. Yeah, it fed me a lot. One of the uh, other intimidating factors that, aside from the, Cros the, the Crosby mustache mafia, was the size of the Keats. Seven foot three, like like kids, like crazy, like bleach blonde hair. I think Brian was the youngest, right? His was a little more yep, dirty blonde. Scott. But yep. Scotty and but John were like lumberjack giants. And uh, again, the Todd was still a, a, a intimidating force, and they fought out here one day, right, Derek? And um, I encouraged John to stick up for himself because Todd was about fifteen years older than us, and uh, John took on the fight. It was close. Looked like John was gonna get the uh, edge. Todd bit him in the nose. Fight over. I was like, man, made me even more afraid of Todd. Yeah, the, Todd was. He must have been held back, right? Because he was. I felt like he was older than me. Yeah, he was like. Yeah. Four, he was like 42 years old. <laughs> so you know, Todd had convinced me to fight Jimbo one day in like seventh grade. Like I, Jimbo was just. I don't know. He was Jimbo at the time, you know. And he's like, you can fight him. He's unorthodox. He'll go to punch you in the head and he'll hit you in the knee. And like him and Eddie Castelletto, same thing. They're like, there, come on, you should fight him. So by the end of the school day, everyone knew that we were fighting. But to Jimbo's credit, he knew I was a good kid. He put his arm around. He's like, I don't want to fight you, buddy. You know what? Before, and we became, we actually became real good friends after that. I, I mentioned in the in the prelude to this to this video that I felt the same way. That like the book, he, the, he was like everybody was either a burnout, metalhead, athlete. Jimbo presented as a skinhead. Yeah. Engineer boots. He did. He had the, and then the red, the red you boots, get right? to know him. He was a pussy cat of a guy. He was salt he was of the earth. Dude. He really was. He's a good dude. He salt was, of the earth. Wasn't as a good dude. Yes. Time I see him. Just so friendly. So the Wilcox, now were Renee's uh, cousins because Trish and Debbie were sisters and the Wilcox were. Debbie's kids. You're no, talking they, the Wilcox is from the Newland Street? Freddie, Billy? No, Dennis. Oh, Dennis. Yeah, that's the same family, though. They lived right here, I believe. Okay. Dennis, you're going to have to correct me on this. Is this where you, you and Kelly lived? You can correct me, but yeah, I used to go, go over to see the Wilcoxes when they were little. Before he could whip my ass. But Joey, Joey, again, I, I mentioned, I used to change his diapers. What was this called back here? Quarter Malie, right? They, no, no, that's the that's why by, over by the bell box. Or did the Wilcox what? live here? Where, where's Quarter Malie? Over by the public pool. Oh, yeah, okay. The post office. What they call this over here? They had their name for this field over here. We we played football again. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And I and uh, uh, Troy Sellers and uh, Nick Nasty Nick. They played a gig out back here one year. But maybe the Wilcox lived in this court. Joe Johnson. You remember Joe Johnson? Yeah. Hell yeah. Black hair with the biker's leather. Cool as motherfucker. Um, who else are we missing now? No. Hold on, back up, back up. The Rizzler, Eric Grasso, lived around here too. I think he used to run around with a shitty diaper near the Wilcox's house as well before he lost his hair in the back. Uh, another one, friends with everybody, transcended every neighborhood. Eric Grasso, is this the right area where you live, bro? Yeah, yeah it's a house. All right, so I covered this area. Is there anybody from this area that we need to cover? Mm -hmm. I mean, I that, that so. back there is Pete Kinnon's backyard. He, he had a gig or two on our yeah. graduation day. Now the his, first his brother played Persuader. They Persuader, great. Chris Kinnon. Yes, I played back. I was back at vocals. The only time I ever sang in front of a crowd in my life. How could I forget Chris Kinnon? Drunk karaoke. Chris Kinnon rivaled David Donahue for looks, but David Donahue never sang. Chris oh, did. Yeah, Chris did all right for himself. I'll tell you. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. And now Pete, Todd, and Peter Kinnon had the two. First mullets I've ever seen. The the bleached blonde. I don't know if he was just albino blonde when he was younger, but him and Todd rivaled. They had dark and light mullets. I got, I got a great picture of Pete in like sixth grade. He's got like the army jacket on and a sex pistols pin and yeah, he looks like a real asshole. Okay, you, Pete, you're my you're my best friend, pal, but I love you. Pete Ken, I never really talked to him much, but he was always nice to me. I so. talked to him all the time. So, so where did the Crosbys live? Was it? I here? thought they lived on that. End unit right there, right on the corner. Maybe, I thought. maybe they did. Sarah lived around here as well. So I think Troy lived there. Troy yeah, might all these there. houses look the same now. Yeah. I, I, where was Jimbo? Down around the bend here? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. See, this is where it gets shady for me because I didn't venture out this far. <laughs>
Well, you know the difference between the Linden projects and the New York Street projects, right? What Jamie? is what is what is the difference between right. the Linden? And Street listen, we all wear it as a badge of honor. I want to be very clear about this, okay? It's not completely one hundred percent accurate, but in most situations, in my opinion, in in my experience, the Linden projects had dual parents. There was this was a veterans project. The Newland Street projects was basically single parents. There was a few exceptions, but the most confusing day of the year down the Newland Street projects was Father's Day because there wasn't a lot of them down there. So that was the difference, right? So there's a lot of like single moms down there. Here I felt like, you know, like Pete had his parents, you know, you know what I mean? Butchie and Gene, Peter's parents. Lived. I think it was, you had to be a veteran to qualify to get into these projects. Down there it was like, you know, the the island of you know misfit toys as far as I, you know my mother was divorced our our apartment burned down and like jimmy conway who was a mayor at the time my mother had campaigned for like yeah, yeah, called in a home. favor and like got us you know the the two bedroom even there was you know at the time there was five of us no four of us and then we got the upgrade to to the three bedroom at 250 newland street i was down next to like Husto and louis border and everybody but that's the difference in these projects i believe okay so then you had someone the person that I can compare to myself who lived so close to the projects, like me, but wasn't actually a project kid, yes. was Mick Pesatoro. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mick Pesatoro, I became friends with in shop, and I was, you know, just fresh out of Death Wing since we didn't do anything. So I decided to take up the guitar, and Mick was my teacher. He lived over here on Springville. So after school, I would go here. Careful, the people. I see you. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Now, Bunny, I believe, was a crossing guard in these days. Bunny, you'll have to correct me on that. But yes, I used to come to your house and was, was it this it, one? Was it this one right here? Mick, which one was it? Maybe it 60? was 60. Mm -hmm. I think it was this one. I'd come up here with my Hondo guitar. It was either this. I think it was this one. Yeah, I've been, I only been there once to pick up that guitar. That was it. It was either this one or that one. Anyhow, Mick taught me guitar and he says, Forbes, there's a hundred guitar players in the school. Not enough drummers. Go to the drums. And I did. Outside of Mick, there are a few more legendary um, characters that deserve the honorable mention of this region of Malden. And they were just outside the Linden bubble. And I'm talking about the Keenan family. Now, Mark, Melanie, when we're my age, Paul was still in diapers, shitting his pants too. And they lived, they lived, hmm, I believe it was here. Yes, Mark Keenan, I always had a strong appreciation for because he was the only kid in Malden High School that was skinnier than I was, if that was even possible. And Melanie obviously held court here as well. Um, but Paul, shitty diapers back when I was running around here. Shout out to the Keenan family. I would be remiss not to mention another character on the outer banks of the Linden area. Now, not a Linden kid, but it was still this piece of rock that was connected to the 108. And I'm talking about Paul Stathos. Unique, unique character. Very quiet. Carried the big stick. Kept his mouth shut. But the first time I ever seen Stathos, who lived right here, he lived nestled away from the chaos of Linden, but he had his own little secret crew of his own. We had Brian, David Pashoe, and Setsa. The motherfucker looked like the real stray cat, Brian himself. Paul Miller, uh, Chick. Um, I don't know where, if, where they lived around this area. I think Pash was from this area, but in this house uh, is where Paul Stathos lived and we met at Smiley Buick officially. We were actually introduced to one another and became friends after that. And we would play wiffle ball here. He'd pitch from that angle. I'd bat from over here. 
with cars going by just like that and the home runs were up on the roof and I used to whoop his ass every time. But uh, yeah, the Stathos house. Um, naturally, we became good friends post high school. Many parties here. So it was here that I actually spoke to Paul Stathos for the first time. We used to have hardcore neighborhood hockey games here in this it was kind of a, yeah, it was a hockey court. It had boards, but they moved it over to this side. But um, all of us from all different neighborhoods would come to Linden post high school. And um, my memorable first impression of knowing Paul Stathos was the bare knuckle brawl with John Baglio during a hockey game. Yes, we had hockey fights. And um, it was never kept personal after that. But stats Baglio, butt of a lifetime here. Um, okay, Derek, as you might see, they, they've done a lot of changes to this park, but a lot of activity at this park. Derek, do you have some stories? I just remember Halloween night being crazy down there. Yeah. It's kind of where everybody congregated. You know, you were drinking, but you also still wanted to egg and shave and cream everybody. And it was just, it was like a, like something, it looked like Braveheart. Like everybody, it was just like, you didn't know who was on whose side. It was just awesome. Like, I, I have fond memories. And I'm talking like two or three Halloweens in a row when you're in your peak time. I yeah. down here with Chad Cummings, Scott Snook, those type of people. Chad Cummings. Kids. Chad Cummings. R.I.P., bro. Always nice to me, man. Good dude. Always nice to me. Good dude. Very nice. Now, this was the wall, I believe, that you'd see Jackie on. You'd see Kevin Gilligan. you see all the girls here smoking the cigarettes. And I would avoid them, too, because they, they, they would whoop your ass if... If you looked like your ass could be whooped. <laughs> Baseball park down there, whatever. But yeah, they, they redid the school, right? Yeah, this wasn't there. The school went all the way back there. So the, the hockey rink's back here. Uh, now th this indoor hockey ball, whatever. This closed hockey rink would be like pushed down. Right, but, right. But yeah, this place was great. Well, that covers the Linden Projects. Derek, um, thanks for coming out to be part of this. Oh, happy you're, to be here. You're a Malden uh, historian like myself. We like to celebrate what was once great. Um, maybe one day we can make Malden great again, huh? Making Malden great again. I think we'd have to buy the city. Put up Charles Street Bowling Alley again. I can't afford this city now. There's too many condos, bro. It's unfortunate, but I'm still stuck here. <laughs> yeah, but you can still do business here. My, my family house is still there. Now, I still live here. I'm back to my roots, I tell people. Here's a, here's a trivia question. Since we, were, since we were born in 70, right? Yeah. What institution still exists today in the city? I know the answer. I'm just What institution? Yep, like business institutions. Beside the high school. Beside you mean the library? You library mean? would the be library, one, yep. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, like business wise? Oh man, that's a good Is there a lot of them? Is that what you're no, saying? No, no, there's not a lot of them. No, um I don't Actually know. I think there's only one more. Can I get a hint? Yeah. Sure. Give me uh, a hint. It's something that I need desperately done with the, what in the vessel that you have. A car detail place? Who's? Come on, you're close. Uh, what, what is it? A car wash? Oh, the yeah. car wash. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, the car wash. That car wash is terrible, by the way. Yeah, I know. But, but, it's, but it still exists. Right. Like in all of the uh, aesthetics. Correct. It's uh, still wow, the same walking wild. through. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty sad. You know, I see, I, I've tried to do a, a doc on That's Daniels. That's a real good point. Huh? Everything that was once is no longer. Yeah. Busy. You figured D and D produce maybe no it's all gone. Jackson's Industries maybe. Yeah, he's my landlord. He owns my building. Yeah. Uh, Burger King's still there. Those type Burger of King is Burger a good King one. Yeah. You know what I mean? But uh, other than that, McDonald's moved from there to there. Then it became a Papa Gino's, and now it's just a strip outlet. Yeah. Maplewood Square used to be the best. We had two of everything in Maplewood Square. I consider myself a Maplewood kid. Because that's where. Well, that's I'm, what I'm, that's, that's why you were brought in because right. you, you you got all these. But they had we had two banks, right? You had the bank for savings, and you had right. the, the trust bank. You had two insurance agencies at the time, Ed Sandler and Mister New, which I ended up buying years later. Yeah. Um, you had two drug stores, Maplewood Drug and Arcella Drug. You had uh, two convenience stores, Sunny Hurst and uh, the other place there. What is the other one? Yeah, I, still there. I made the, the comparison of like, not the comparison, but like the the drawing of like, there were Maplewood and Linden were like allied faction neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, that's why my mother tried to keep me out of Newland and keep me up there. Right. I mean, it was... But, you know, Ma but Maplewood still had their back lot of characters that were 
that stayed there. But there was a large group that interacted on both sides. If Maplewood was middle upper class, Oak Grove was upper class. How's right. that? Does yeah. that sound fair? Uh, without a doubt. It was far, you know, and then, then, then there was us. But you lived on the nice street. Right. The Holloway Street was, I mean, to me, that was the dream. Like, everybody had the swimming pools. Like, I, you know. Oh, yeah, I used to catch shit for fucking having a house. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then kind of, you know, if people were mad at me, be like, you're not Newland. Yeah, people just like to hate. Yeah. Forty years ago, it was the same way, apparently. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's that's that sounds like a them problem. No oh, shit. Look at this beautiful school, huh? And there Marsha it is. Marsha P. Brown School. And there it is, another fucking. And to end this with a with a good um, that was plug. The, that was Leo's market right there. If you want the best insurance, <laughs> you want your house, car, business, your business, all of it. No, your, no life and no health. If you want to insure your penis, <laughs> Derek will put a premium on that. <laughs> so, Derek Witham Insurance, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Friendliest, friendliest atmosphere. You'll never catch me here all those hours, just know that. 322 Auto, Derek Witham Insurance. And this sums up the Linden Malden Time Capsule.